John of the Eye Patch, Chapter 30. It's a kind of magic. John was anxious to return to pirate times and tell his mom of the discovery he made. Dinner was an excruciating wait, as was the walk back to the hotel. After sundown, John and his dad watched the news while they got ready for bed. The weather report called for thunderstorms all the next day. Well, John, that's going to set our plans back, his dad said. We were supposed to travel by boat with the supplies. They won't let us to sea with inclement weather. We traveled all this way, and we're not going to be able to help? Don't worry, John. We'll get there. It just means we have to wait for the weather to cooperate, his dad said. With teeth brushed and half an hour of pre-bed reading, they finally had lights out in the early night. John waited until he felt certain his dad had fallen asleep. Then he arranged his pillows under the bed in the appropriate shape of his body. Finally, pulling the comforter high up enough to make it look like he was asleep under the covers. Once that was done, he slipped on the eye patch and he traveled back in time. Now that he was transporting back and forth in the Caribbean, there was no time or weather change, only the change from fixed flooring to the slightly rocking deck of the Dragon of Plunder that was still at anchor. He found his mom in the great cabin, hunched over the table, inspecting a poorly made sketch of Blackbeard's tower. Mom, Mom, I found a way in, John told her. He explained the rest as they hiked the two miles toward Blackbeard's tower. Under the cover of deep night, they crept to the small hillock overlooking Blackbeard's tower. Why the tower wasn't on the highest piece of ground seemed confusing to John, until he realized the hillock was so small that the tower and its walls would encircle the base of it. From the elevated vantage, he took a charcoal stick from his mom and improved the sketches of the tower. There, he said, he drew an X where he found it, the hole in the wall in the present time. Okay, let's go see, his mom said. They waited until the lone guard with a torch crossed the far side of the ramparts and then doubled over to the base of the tower. John felt the stones of the wall. They were intact. It's not here, he whispered to his mom. Barely any starlight penetrated the overhead clouds and John could barely see his mom raise a finger to her lips. Shh. He didn't say any more. Who's there? Crawled the crackety bird-like voice of Mr. Griffin. John imagined the vulture-like man with a hunched back and a beak-like nose. I know you're out there, Mr. Griffin continued. I could smell you a mile away. This tower flies Blackbeard's flag. Be gone or risk his wrath. John felt his mom tug his arm, and he crept after her away from the tower. When they were safely back in the tree line and walking back to the harbor, John said, The hole doesn't exist yet. It was a good idea, John, his mom said, but it didn't work out. Don't even think about telling me to stay home, John said, before his mom could suggest it. How do you know we're not the ones to make the hole? It'd take a, something with a lot of kick to a put a hole in that wall. More than a cannonball, Mom? Three or four might do the trick. Back at Dragon of Plunder, they conferred with Blackbird and Mr. Owens in the candlelight great cabin. We need a cannon, and somebody knows how to shoot it, he told them. Hey, don't look at me, Blackbird waved his hands in front of him. I have trouble hitting the water. How could you have trouble hitting the water? John asked. He figured that as long as the cannon was aimed in the direction of water, gravity would take care of getting the cannonball to the water eventually. Remember that beef party? You know, the T-Bone with Blackbeard's ship? Blackbird prompted. Yeah, the T-Bone, John and his mom said. Yeah, whatever. Well, at the time, we were experimenting with some quick-fire cannons. Blackbird fiddled with the top button of his coat. The collision set them off. Pow! He punched his fist in the air. Pow, pow! He punched his other fist in the air. Two more holes in Queen Anne's revenge. 
John and his mom were speechless as they stared at Blackbird. Finally, John shook off the shock from Blackbird's further incompetence and asked, Mr. Owens, is there anyone on the ship that knows how to shoot a cannon? Shoot? Aye. Aim? Nay. Get your cannons, yay, close. He held his hands out as wide as they would go, and then he inched them till they were, until they were about shoulder width. Yay, close. And you be getting a hit. Mom? Cannons are about ballistics. Ballistics? Ballistics is the study of how projectiles fly. Sadly, math was not one of my stronger subjects. She shook her head no. Fortunately, there were other people John could ask. He had the internet and Alyssa. How could he contact Alyssa now that he traveled over a thousand miles away? Well, leave the aiming to me, John said. What I need you to do is to get a cannon to that hillock overlooking the tower. What good is that going to do? Blackbird asked. They'll know we're shooting at them. I doubt they'll surrender. There's going to be a thunderstorm tomorrow, John said, remembering the weather forecast. We're going to go under the cover of thunder. There was just a hurricane. How could there be thunderstorms tomorrow? Blackbird pulled his hat off and threw it on the desk. I saw it on the evening news, John said. The what be knee hoos? Mr. Owens asked. John suddenly realized he had no way to explain television to the pirates. He looked to his mom for help, but she just rolled her eyes. You know, like a, like a newspaper, John said, hoping they had heard of that. Blackbird and Mr. Owens looked at him with confused expressions. John considering telling them that he was a time traveler, that in the future they had thing called forecasts and they could predict the weather. But that would only cause more fear than it was resolve. Instead, John opted for a more simple explanation. Well, it's kind of like magic. Blackbird and Mr. Owens nodded. Aha, uh -huh. in understanding. John returned to the closet berth to slip off the eye patch and return to the hotel room. He hiked to Blackbeard's tower twice in one night, and he was feeling overwhelmed with fatigue. As soon as his head hit the pillow, he was asleep, only to be awakened far earlier than he was ready. His eyes were bleary and raw from the previous morning. Up and at him, John, his dad said. I don't know when we're going to get all this all cleared to travel, so we always need to be ready, he said. John slogged out of bed. He dressed and he followed his dad to a small cafe down the street where they ate Swiss pastries and hot chocolate and coffee. After breakfast, John and his dad returned to the hotel to check on the weather forecast and coordinate with other relief teams. Just one look at the ominous gray sky was enough for John to realize they weren't going to be traveling today. But the weather would be perfect for hiding the cannon strike on Blackbeard's Tower. That night, John repeated his trick of arranging pillows to shape like his body and slipped on the eye patch when he met with his mom, Blackbird, and Mr. Owens in the great cabin. Let's go while we can use the thunderstorm as cover, John said. No way, Blackbird said, slices in his hand back and forth in front of him. I'm not getting hit by any lightning. It's okay. We won't be anywhere near the lightning. How ye be knowing that? When you see the lightning, count how high you get by the, you multiply how high you get by the, the time, you count the time. You hear the thunder, it's, it's how many miles away it is. As the time gets shorter, it gets closer. We hide. How can counting tell you where the lightning is? It has to do with the speed of sound. It's like five seconds a mile or something, John said. I don't know about that, Blackbird said. I mean, it doesn't take very long for your voice to reach me. It's because we're right next to each other, John said. Light travels faster than sound. John realized he was getting nowhere trying to teach them about the speed of thunder versus the speed of lightning. Instead, he went to the answer that worked last time. Well, it's, it's magic. Oh. Both Blackbird and Mr. Owens nodded their head like that explained everything. 
But what if you're lying about this magic, boy? Blackbird asked. What if the storm was just a good guess? I mean, sometimes I'm right about the weather, too. Uh, that's true. Sometimes he be right, Mr. Owens agreed with a nod. Here, let me show you I have magic. John pulled off the eye patch and teleported from the rocking floorboards of the Dragon of Plunder to the stable ground of the hotel. His dad was snoring. He quickly pulled the eye patch back on and was back on the running ship, suddenly dizzy from teleporting back and forth. By the time his vision cleared, he saw Blackbird and Mr. Owens staring at him with wide eyes and wider mouths. They both whispered, it be magic. While a group of burly pirates rode the cannons down the shoreline in the long boat, Blackbird, Mr. Owens, John, and John's mom walked overland to Blackbeard's tower. I can't believe you've been a wizard all this time and you didn't tell us. Blackbird skipped while the others walked. I mean, it would have been the first thing out of my mouth. Hi there, I'm John of the Eye Patch, and I'm a wizard. I'm not... It's not something I really want people to know, John said. Sure, sure, sure. We'll keep it on the down low, Blackbird said. Nobody but the four of us will know, like a secret. And you know me, this mouth's like a treasure chest. Ain't nobody gonna get any of my secrets. Shh, John's mom whispered as a couple pirates walked by. Hey, you two, did you know that John's a wizard? Blackbird pointed animatedly at John. John blessed. He's had too much grog, John's mom said. Once the pirates are outside of earshot, she added in a quiet but threatening voice. You said you'd keep the secret. Right, sure, sure, sure. Mom's the word. I won't say anything to anyone. It's just us four. Blackbird ran his finger up and down his lips like he was screwing them or sewing them shut. When another pirate came along the road, Blackbird yelled, Hey! And he got a sharp elbow to the ribs, courtesy of John's mom. It was enough to keep John's secret at least a little longer. They reached the tower at the same time the pirates were pulling the cannon up the beach. Once in position, they loaded the cannon with powder and a ball. John set the aim directly at the base of the tower. How we be knowing when to fire? Mr. Owens asked. When the, when the lightning starts, John said, we can count the time between the lightning strikes and thunder. If it stays pretty much the same, we can just wait for a lightning strike count and then fire the cannon which is exactly what they did after three lightning strikes confirmed the storm was four miles away and they were able to time their cannonball blast the boom of the cannon was swallowed by the growl of the thunder the ball thudded in the mud halfway to the tower john winced they were far enough away that gravity had pulled the ball down too soon but how high would they have to aim John tilted the barrel of the cannon to aim at the top of the tower. They waited for another lightning strike, timed the shot, and this time, the cannonball slammed into the base of the tower. John pumped his fist in glee. Stay here, he told the pirates, and he hurried across the field to the looming tower. Under the cover of darkness, he inspected the wall, and he found a hole, a hole exactly the size of the hole from the present. It was just big enough for the lanky John to crawl through.